All right. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I'm your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. Uh, the show is broadcast live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show, and it is then posted to our website later for you to watch at your convenience. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can get all the archives. We uh, do a mixture of both the live show and the archives are free and open to anyone to watch. So please share uh, with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone who you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. The Nebraska Library Commission here is the state agency for libraries in Nebraska. And that, for those of you that aren't you know, local to our state, and um, that is for all libraries, all types of libraries. So you will see things on our show that are for uh, public libraries, K-12, academic, correction facilities, museums, all across the board. Um, we're just you know, all about anything, anything related to li having to do with libraries we have on the show. Um, and we have a mixture of things here, um, book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, demos of services and products we think that may be of interest to you. There's a lot of things out there for you to see. Uh, we have the Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes do presentations, but we also bring in guest speakers sometimes. And that's what we have this morning um, from uh, out in western Nebraska, the other end of the state from where I am. <laughs> We have with us this morning, we're going to talk about um, virtual reality. Let's get real about virtual reality. And with us, we have uh, Nate Doherty. Nate, you're all the people's right. Yeah. <laughs> and Christine Fullerton, who are both from our Shadron State College. And Carl, I, Carl Spiker, is that how you pronounce your name? Fisher. Fisher. Ah, I knew I'd get it wrong without asking. <laughs> Who's from Shadron Public Library out there? And they're going to talk to us about what they've been um, experimenting with and doing with um, a VR and all the, the fun things you see, you know, in, in your Best Buy when you walk by <laughs> and probably other things. So I'll just let you guys take it away and tell us all about what you've been doing. Well, great. Thank you, Krista. Um, like Krista said, I'm Christine Fullerton. I'm the public services librarian here at Chatham State. And Nathaniel, we actually hired um, two years ago. And he came in mostly just to work in the media lab and VR. So he's had a very specialized job. We've had him do a few other things, but he's worked about 16 to 20 hours just to kind of build up this program that we have. Um, and then as we were planning this, we thought it would be nice to bring in Carl from the public library, because about the same time that we were doing some VR, um, they started doing some things with VR too. And we thought it would be nice to get a perspective um, from both a public and an academic. A little bit about Shadron, because um, I know a lot of you aren't watching from Nebraska. We are a town of about 6,000 people, and then the college is about 3,000. Um, we're kind of geared towards liberal arts. We also have some education and business programs, and a few other. We have a big rangeland. And a big rangeland program as well. So um, when we were kind of looking for uh, programs that might, uh, VR programs that might support those programs, that's kind of what we were keeping in mind. So the reason we got into VR, um, we got a donation about four years ago to create a media lab. That was really the only stipulation is that we needed to do a media lab. So we did a media lab um, with some computers with art software, music software, and electronic piano. And then we also bought um, a Rift, which we're going to show uh, you guys in a little bit. So that's uh, kind of how we started getting into it. We our director at the time was pretty techy, um, and so she was really up on this. And then when she left, that left a little bit of a void. And so that's one of the main reasons we hired Nate was to kind of move this project forward. Um, we've also made some changes in the last year or so. One of the main things, we'll talk about space a little bit later, but you can see that we're in this big room. Our previous location for the VR was in the media lab, and it was just in like a maybe a four foot four foot by four foot space. So very kind of constrained. And that worked okay when we first got the VR because um, most of the games and programs were a little bit uh, less mobile. And now as we've, as it's progressed, there's a lot of things where you really need to be moving around. And so we found that people were kind of running into walls or they were running into people behind them or it just felt very constrained and it didn't feel very safe. And since VR can be so immersive, 
we want people to feel very safe and secure when they're when they're doing these things because it is you're really transported to a different world. So we'll talk a little about space and space requirements later. So since we moved upstairs, one of the things that we've been able to do is uh, to partner with the learning lab with our tutors. We have we found that for us, students are really great advocates. So a lot of the tutors are pretty into the VR. And so they're great to um, both, I mean, they play games too, but also to show some of the programs that we have for pedagogical um, implications. Um, that's another reason why we went with VR is um, our director at the time was also in charge of the Teaching and Learning Center and so this was a nice bridge to think of some of the pedagogical tools that we could use with VR and then also have it housed in the library. So um, another reason that we bought, brought in Nate was we found that um, students were finding games okay. Robo Recall is a really popular one and there's a few other popular ones. But we really wanted to, value. yes, <laughs> we, uh, not a lot of educational value, cool, but we wanted to um, be able to find some educational things too. So um, that's kind of how we got into VR. And we're gonna give Carl a little bit of time to talk about what, why they decided to. Sure, so um, our director wanted to get uh, more technology for the public library. Uh, one of the first things we got was a 3D printer. And then after that, we decided to get PlayStation VR. Uh, the reason why we went with PlayStation VR is because we're very um, space limited. So with the Oculus headset, you have to have sensors in the corners. And because of such a small space that the library has, um, we decided to go with the PlayStation. Um, with the PlayStation VR, all that you need is one camera, and then it will track the headset instead of having the sensors on the wall. Mm -hmm. um, another thing too is PlayStation VR is a lot cheaper than the other options. And we were concerned about the budget too, but we wanted to get um, a hold into the VR space, so we decided to go with that. Great, thanks, Rob. Mm -hmm. um, so we wanted to talk a little bit, just an overview of what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk a little about the space requirements and um, setup and um, technical requirements that you'll need. Um, we're going to talk briefly about some of the various VR systems. There's a few different ones out there. Um, we have Oculus, but there's also HTC Vive, which is pretty popular. Um, and then we're going to talk a little about balancing pedagogy and fun. So um, thank you for your patience. One of the reasons we were running late today is because we wanted to try and do like a screen share so you could see a little bit about what VR looks for um, uh, people that are watching along. Uh, VR is really like most interesting for the person actually wearing the headset. But we set up this room in a way we have, that's one of the reasons we have this big screen is so that other people can uh, watch along. So they can still get some of the benefit of it. It's just not as immersive. It's you know just a 2D instead of an immersive technology. So um, we're not sure how many of you have actually seen VR components before. So we wanted to show you some of the things that we have. So for the Rift, just to show you, this is what the headset looks like. And we're gonna have Carl model it for you. And so you would be facing to this screen, but we'll show you what this looks like. So um, you can see that we've got, there's the eye holes, obviously. Um, and then the audio is right, right on the sides. And so you can adjust it um, on your head. And so you can pull it back a little bit and push it forward. So we've got that. Kind of goes on like a diving mask, like a snorkel mask. Yeah. Um, we always like, especially when somebody is new to VR, we like to have a buddy with them because it is, especially with the audio on, it's very immersive. And so it can be kind of disorienting on where you're located. Um, that's gotten a lot better since we have this big space, but we still do have to worry about the cord and a few other things. So Nate's going to turn Carl around. I guess we'll see. It's very hard to see where you're at. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then you can just give them the controllers, which are a little bit like just a regular um, video game controller. This one um, is a little bit more involved than some of the other ones. It's got a joystick and the A and B and then some triggers. So when you're navigating the VR, that's how you would do it. So we have that. And then we also have, we'll let you take that off now, I think. Sure. 
We also have um, the PlayStation VR, which Carl is going to show all of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Nate will model that. So PlayStation VR is kind of similar to the Oculus, except you need a PS4 instead of a PC. Um, how you put the headset on is slightly different. There's a little button on the back where you can adjust it. Oh, yeah. Um, I've noticed that the quality is very similar to the Oculus Rift. Um, there you go. Pretty easy. Yeah, there's no speakers on the side like the like the Oculus has. So you can either use the, the headset that comes with it, or you can buy a third party one. I didn't bring that here today, but that's what we decided to do. And yeah, the headset, yeah, let me try to put this on. Okay, so the headset goes into a separate box, and then that box goes into the PlayStation 4. And most games will use um, the motion controls, and it tracks using the light on the controller. Let's see if I can turn this on. Yeah, these look really cool when they're all set up with the PlayStation um, VR because they light up and they're really they're really cool to look at. Um, we didn't bring the whole PlayStation system because we didn't think um, since we can't really show you um, what Nate's seeing, we thought yeah, there wasn't yeah. really much reason. So I guess we have to be on the PS4 for this. Yeah, yeah, so that's how that works. Yeah. So yeah, the, the PS4. The main difference between this and the Oculus one is. It uses a camera to track the lights on the headset and on the controls, where versus the Oculus, it will use sensors in the corners to track your position. Yeah. Okay. And the, the thing that they have in common is that both this the Rift and the PlayStation have to be plugged into a much larger machine. For the Rift, it's a, it's a big computer that sits underneath the table here. For the PlayStation, it's a PlayStation. <laughs> yes. And then the last one that we want to show you that we have here in Chadron is the Oculus Go. Um, and all of these will work with glasses. For me, I find it more comfortable to, to not wear glasses. Yeah. Um, well, that's the thing with the PlayStation headset, too, is you can wear glasses with it. Yeah. yeah. Um, it and is a little bit more comfortable than the Rift is. With right. The right there. So this. Um, it's kind of going to look the same as the Rift, but you can see that I'm not tethered to anything. <laughs> yeah, I just I get a big head. Um, and then uh, there's just one small controller. Yeah. So with this, it uh, navigates a little bit differently. Mostly what you're going to be doing is kind of looking at things. You can turn um, your head, and, but you can't move around in the space just by moving your actual body. Right. Yeah. But it has the advantage of not needing to be hooked up to anything at all. It's totally independent. Does that one have the audio as well? The head, or? It does. It, uh -huh. does. it has these clever little speakers that are actually built into the face part mm -hmm. of uh -huh. the eye holes. Uh, and they kind of project the sound directly back towards your ears. Oh, it doesn't sound like it should work, but it really does. Yeah, it's <laughs> It really works, yeah. Because the way it looks, I couldn't see if it had the, yeah. yeah you, you can, uh, it does have a hookup for your, for headphones. If you want to wear headphones, you can. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and so this one will actually um, allow people to leave. Um, you can check these out at um, the circulation desk. And so you don't need to use this in, in the room. You can use this anywhere in the library. We don't let it leave the library, but anywhere in the library. Um, and then this one, since it's a standalone, it just needs to be charged periodically. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so we've talked a little bit about this space already. Um, so we've got freer movement in here. You know, you could see that just having the control loops and everything, you want to be able to have a wide, mm -hmm. a wide berth. And also a lot of the games you are kind of walking forward just slightly. Um, and so we wanted to give plenty of movement for that. So over to me then? I think so. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we actually built the Oculus Rift into this room. Um, the first step was finding a better room for it um, that allowed us, at Oculus Rift and 
I think the PlayStation VR may have this too. I know the Vive has it as well, the HTC Vive. Um, a program within the side, within the sort of hardware that you can use to set up safety bounds around your virtual play area, so that if you're moving around in virtual reality, you don't you can set up a warning if you're coming close to an actual wall. Um, our previous space was too small; we couldn't do that. Uh, it has certain minimum requirements for space. Uh, this room we have plenty, and so we've upgraded from like a four by four space to something more like a six by six or even seven by seven area within this room that we can actually use to walk around in in virtual reality, which makes a big difference in terms of fun and immersivity. Um, but let me show you the room. Um, I do we we do have a power series of PowerPoint slides that we will make sure is available after. Uh, I can't show it to you right now just because of our technology problems, but what we did, the Oculus, in order to have um, in order to have full room scale 3D, the Oculus needs three sensors. Um, what we've done is instead of having them mounted on tables around the room, which we did, and it was our initial solution, the problem is if those sensors are disturbed, the whole system needs to be reset. So what we did, uh, thanks to the help of our learning lab manager, Tom Tiley, is we actually were able to mount the sensors. You can just see the bottom edge of that one right there. That's one of the sensors. Yeah. The other one is mounted uh, behind our camera here on the ceiling. And, and Christine is showing the one up there right by her hand. And we've, we got these um, pretty cheap, sticky uh, modular tracking that kind of contains the cords. So it makes tripping a lot less of a hazard. You can see with the cord coming from the helmet, um, or from the face mask, right? This is now the lone sort of tripping hazard. It can still be kind of annoying, but it's much more manageable than having four. Mm -hmm. um, and we were able to, because we have drop ceilings, we're able to run the cords through the ceiling where we needed to. Um, all, all done for without expert knowledge and with a pretty low budget for the actual integration into the room. I think probably this entire setup costs less than fifty dollars to, you know, just to buy the stickies and all of that. Um, the, the 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 sensors are stuck to the ceiling and the walls just with command strips, um, so we can take them off without damaging the uh, the wall or the paint. Um, okay, so. Uh, and then the last thing we did was get this very large screen. Um, I don't know the dimensions, but you can see it's quite quite large. <laughs> it's actually it's it's sort of a Roku smart TV, um, so you could run a, a video sharing service through it. We use it as a monitor. Uh, the idea is that for educational applications, we wanted instructors to be able to give group projects to students that were using VR. Um, this allowed many of these many of these experiences, these VR software that you can see sort of here. When you put them, when you put the helmet on, the headset on, and start the program, it'll start a secondary display for anyone standing in the room around the uh, you, the primary user. So those people will get to see a two-dimensional uh, version of what the person actually wearing the headset can see. And see, this is allowed a couple. As you know, an audience, like a spectator you can see what they're seeing inside right right and, it, and it's, it's really amazing how different it is um uh when you compare the two there's a there's a big difference but it's enough for say we had a group of biology students that were measuring stress responses in a scary oh. game uh, and it allowed the observers as the students running the test to actually watch and see when the jump scare came so they knew when to start doing their recording their their data um so something like that uh, if you're using a historical program, you know, it, it, and you're, you're touring, an, there's one where you can tour an ancient Roman house uh, with lots of very helpful voiceover. Um, in that case, um, you're not, you don't need to worry about, you know, jump scares and things like that, but at least there's something for the other participants to look at. Uh, and it, it has worked pretty well. Um, one of the main limitations of VR as a teaching tool is that it's very much a one person, one user activity at the moment. Um, and so I must step on the cord again. Um, <laughs> so that's a limitation, but the screen helps make helps reduce the impact of that limitation a little bit. Um, okay, so we were also able to uh, when we moved upstairs, we essentially rebuilt the initial computer we had purchased to go with our virtual reality system. As Christine mentioned, um, the games had changed a lot, the processing power demands had changed a lot, and we had an opportunity 
uh, between myself and Tom Tiley, who I mentioned earlier, we had both built computers periodically. Uh, and so we knew that we had the expertise and we did have the time to do it. And thanks to the gift that Christine mentioned in the beginning, we had the, the funds. Um, so there are certain, uh, you can get the minimum specifications for hardware and software. Um, they're available on the Oculus website. Um, they're also, they're every major manufacturer, Oculus, HTC, Steam, they all make sure that you can easily find what you need to run their equipment. I do have a series of slides that will be available afterwards that kind of lay out exactly what we did in terms of the specific pieces of the computer that we bought and installed. Uh, there are also several links there that will take you to uh, pre-built systems um, and, and other sort of lists of components, updating lists of components. So anyone that's watching this that wants to build their own system, you, you'll have some resources there in those PowerPoint slides. Of course, you always have the option of just purchasing a system that was built from the manufacturer already prepared to run virtual reality. Um, the reason that we decided to build, I think the biggest reason uh, that we wanted to take that option was that it allowed us to create something that was more modular. So we made sure we got, so when you purchase a, a pre-built system, they're going to they're gonna always try to save space. Uh, it's going to be a very small computer case where everything's going to pack tightly in together very space efficiently. Um, the downside to that is that if, you know, two years down the road, virtual reality becomes much more demanding on your hardware, um, you're going to have to buy a whole new system and maybe spend, you know, $1,500 to $3,000 on that. Uh, for an initial investment of, you know, $3,000 to $3,500, we're able to build a computer that not only will it not need to re be replaced for, you know, we're estimating five years, but if, for instance, the graphics card, which is one of the most important pieces for something doing a graphics intensive thing like VR, if that graphics card gets out of date, instead of buying an entire new system for, you know, minimum $1,500, we can buy a new graphics card for $500 and just install it into this machine because we have the space to do that because the, the case is built to be opened up and reclosed and, and there isn't, we're not gonna have to worry about fitting it in there because there's plenty of internal space. Um, so my thought was, our thought was that uh, this will save us money in the long run because we'll be able to upgrade individual components that need it as opposed to having to buy a whole new system. I think that kind of seems like the responsible thing to do in, in limited fund situation. Um, so I said- And it cost like $1,100 to build it. And it would have cut three thousand to buy. Is that a little? We don't need to get. I think I think we we had some options that were in the eleven hundred dollar area. Um, I think it was more like three once we were done. Gotcha. Um, and if we had upgraded the the graphics card as far as we wanted to, we thought about upgrading to the newest, bestest shiniest graphics card. That would have been much more expensive. We we were able to make do with the one that we already had. Um, but we could have built it for much less. It's true. Um, it wouldn't. We would have had to uh, upgrade it sooner. Um, but let's see. The quote that we were given by IT was significantly higher, so we upgraded our system instead of replacing it. Um, that would have been about forty five hundred. Um, um, so if I'll we didn't have that. Nate and Tom, yeah. we probably would have done the forty five hundred dollar yeah. option because I cannot build a computer. Right. And so yeah. <laughs> so we just were lucky that we had yeah. the expertise and hopefully in a few years when we and uh, two to five years when we need to like make some additions we'll have that same level of expertise yeah. here i think you know as long as tom's still here yes <laughs> he, exactly. he enjoyed it so uh so just make sure you hang up <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay so list of components Oculus. oh so one thing i do want to make clear is that although we're demoing the rift today um Oculus has actually stopped making the Rift. They've, they've started rolling out their newer version, the Rift S, uh, which does make some improvements. It doesn't need as many sensors, but you can still buy the Rift um, and it's still available for, for, from secondary retailers like um, Best Buy and so forth. Um, and I think probably once the Rift S becomes standard, you'll find that the Oculus Rift, the first generation will be cheaper. Uh, so this may even be a better option. Um, but any hardware that we have is still capable of running the Rift. So if we bought a Rift S today, we could just plug it in and hook it up and everything should run fine. Uh, so anybody watching this, if you, if you decide to get the newer hardware, 
the specifications that are going to be in the PowerPoint slides you'll get should still, I'm, I'm confident, will still allow you to use that hardware. Um, one of their goals was, was to have people not have to rebuild their and buy all new systems. Um, they wanted their technology to roll out quickly. Uh, let's see, okay. So you'll have a list of, in those PowerPoints, like also a list of places where you can buy pre-built systems that you don't have to, you know, you don't have to worry about having someone around who knows how to, how to design or put computers together, although it's easier than it seems. Uh, so I'm gonna talk next a little bit about um, upkeep and discovery. How do we maintain the system? How do we add necessary programs to it? And how do we figure out what we need to do? Um, I think the, um, and the best, one of the best options is to find uh, messaging lists uh, and mailing lists that you can get on, um, the, especially from technology suppliers. So I'll, I'll make a couple of recommendations. Um, one would be a, a website called newegg.com that I can provide a link to later. Uh, there's also the Oculus store itself. Uh, so Newegg is a sort of an internet version of Best Buy or a computer specific version of Amazon. Um, the Oculus Store is obviously the makers of the Oculus Rift. They have the software catalog that you see here, uh, a little bit like the um, Apple App Store. Um, you can access that from any browser, and that's where you can download uh, new programs, look for programs, and uh, also buy equipment. Um, <clears throat> and the, the third website that I'll recommend specifically um, is, is an organization called EduCause. Uh, Educause is a, oh, I'll let you, so, okay, there we go, she's bringing it up. I'm trying to follow along and bring up. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, um, it's good, it's good. Educause is a really, is an interesting organization. Um, it's, it's focused on, it's, it's focused on public-private partnerships working to get um, education and technology working together. Uh, you can actually see they're 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 showing some um, virtual reality headsets on their main page right now because it's the new hot thing. Um, uh, Educause, we we signed up for a set, for a webinar early in my uh, tenure in this position. Um, you know they're they're interesting. They they provide a lot of good ideas. They tend to bring in people from industry and from um, libraries, public institutions, and educators to provide examples of what you can do with this and. You know, it, for it, it's a significant subscription fee, but there's a lot of knowledge to be gained there. Uh, you can also just pay for individual webinars, which you know, if, if, if it's just one thing you're very interested in, uh, you don't have to sign up for the whole package, which is pretty good. Um, the limitation of Educause, uh, and it's a pretty big one for places. Even you know, I know that CSC is pretty well. Well, we have we have funds. We had enough funds to build this, but Educause tends to be focused on very large organizations. Uh, that are very well funded. So we found quickly that while it provided a lot of interesting ideas and a lot of interesting inspiration uh, for an institution that doesn't have a, a coding department, a computer design department, or a graphics, uh, computer graphics department, or a gaming department, uh, we were sort of limited in the way we could follow some of them. And um, a lot of, you know, something that the University of Pennsylvania can do, for instance, um, through funding and space that they, they have a lot of all of that. Um, we're not able to follow exactly in the footsteps of a lot of the things we saw in Educause, but like I said, it can give us ideas for where to go uh, and opportunities to look for. And it was a good way to make contact with other smaller libraries looking to kind of get into uh, boosting their technology profile. So sure version of that is Educause, lots of good ideas, largely for very large, well-funded institutions, but still potentially useful uh, and a good way to keep up with what's happening in terms of virtual reality and, and where the technology and the educational capacity are going. Okay, so um, so all of these, as you guys included, but Newegg and Oculus.com, the websites, they're a good way to keep up with anticipating if the software is going to take a jump and become more complicated and demanding. Those are all ways that you can find uh, resource you can find out about that so that you can update your systems or you can you know find you can look for ways to continue to work with what you have um, so that's a lot of high stakes stuff we're talking about building computers and money and uh, big spaces yeah we'll look at low stakes next um, I'll talk specifically about the oculus go but there are several other uh, examples for more low stakes virtual reality options um, 
Again, this is a standalone thing. Usually this is filtered in here. <laughs> Oops, there you go. Um, so this thing you can get for about 350 and um, it's totally self-contained. It doesn't do the same kind of flashy computer uh, dynamics that the uh, Rift does, but it, it does, it is still very immersive and really kind of really interesting. More focused on a media consumption um, experience than the Rift is. Rift is more focused on gaming, but there is gaming for this. Um, so we wanted to go, first of all, for its portability. We could take it anywhere. Uh, theoretically, it could be used in, in a classroom across campus or another you know, room in the library. Good in case this room with the Rift is occupied. Um, it's low cost, as I said, 350 for the entire for the entire functioning setup, as opposed to you know between 1500 and 4500 for building and or purchasing a computer and all the Rift components and controllers. Um, it does have a large software catalog. It sh that's that's a question with these. Um, how how many different kinds of software can you get on it? As you can see here on the screen, uh, you have uh, well here you go. There's the software catalog. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. Uh, so it shares with uh, the Google Play Store, which gives it a lot of options. It shares some programs with the Rift, although its its capacity, you know, its technical capacity is much lower, so it doesn't share everything. But it's nice to have some crossover. Um, so I have uh, okay. Also, oh, why didn't we do Google Cardboard? Is something I wanted to talk about. Um, I was wondering so, about that too. If you're going to mention that do-it-yourself thing. <laughs> yeah. So Google Cardboard is great. Um, all you need is you can you can make for yourself or buy like a little cardboard foldout that serves as the headset. Um, the the sort of paradox there you go you see it's just it's branded Google literally cardboard. <laughs> um, it, it's great and, and a very cheap option if you have a phone that can run it. Um, and because we didn't want to introduce any barriers to patrons, we wanted to make sure that whatever our virtual reality setup was any patron could walk into the library or student and just immediately start using it. Um, if you have a phone that's set up um, to, that can do Google Cardboard, and you can find a list of the phones that work with it probably on this website, um, then, then you have almost no immediate investment. You just need to get the app and maybe some of the software you might have to pay for. If you don't have a phone like that, those phones run in the area of like $600. Uh, you can get them on a payment plan from Verizon or AT&T or whatever, but um, you know, we didn't, we realized that in order for us to get one of those phones, the initial investment would be nothing for the headset, but $600 for the phone. Um, mm -hmm. Then there would be all the questions of like, how do we integrate that phone into our systems? Um, so that's why we decided to go with the Oculus Go for a much cheaper, uh, um, much cheaper option with almost exactly the same impact in terms of what technology it would bring to patrons. Uh, and easier to keep track of uh, at the search desk. Um, so um, the other choice you have, it, so we're talking about hardware choices here. I'll talk about your software choices a little bit too. Uh, are we doing it? We're doing okay on time. Sure, absolutely. Yep, yep. It's only uh, ten of eleven here Central Time. Um, officially, I tell the show is officially ten to eleven a.m. Central Time. But we go as long as it's necessary to get through everything we need to. And we did start a little late to this morning with our technical issues. And we'll go as long as it takes to get through everything you need to talk about here. And we are recording, so if anyone does have to leave early, um, no problem. You'll be able to get get everything um, and the archive later. Excellent. Okay. Um, great. Yeah, it could have been so much cooler. <laughs> um, okay, so um, talking about software now, um, you have several options. If you if you buy an Oculus Rift, um, this thing, your primary software catalog that's designed to work with that technology is going to be the Oculus software catalog. If you go to apps and games there on the screen share, uh, that should give you a sense of what it looks like. Okay. So the nice thing about this software catalog is that every single piece of software here will work with the RIF. Um, there's another option called Steam. Um, and if you want to go there, the, the best website to go to is just steampowered, one word, dot com. And that'll show you their software catalog. Um, there you go. OK, so similar looking layout. 
Um, the difference with Steam, uh, similar idea, it's an online portal through which you can download and maintain a library of software titles. Um, they have Steam a is a category for virtual reality. Right. So, uh, but what that also shows you is that um, Steam is not just about virtual reality. Oculus, the Oculus website is all virtual reality stuff. Steam is all computer games. Mm -hmm. um, I have that account myself for that, actually, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, the uh, Steam also, because of its breadth, uh, also is a, less proportionally focused on educational software. Steam or, or Oculus, on the other hand, seems to have a bit more of a presence of educational software titles. Um, but again, that depends on what you're going for. Um, we decided initially to use Steam as our primary software catalog uh, because the, the software that you download onto your computer provides some options for curation that Oculus doesn't. So you, you can, on the, on the computer interface, not the website, but the software you download, you can lock users out of the store and social functions using a pin. Um, what that means is that a student can't walk in and use the computer to buy something using their own credit card, for instance. They can't search for and install a game even if it's free. Uh, so they're, they're sort of channeled into the, into the titles that we have chosen to present to them. Um, this initially seemed like a really good curation device to, to keep it focused. Uh, we realized, you know, later on that what it doesn't stop uh, is them just going in and logging out of the Steam account that we've logged in with and logging in with their own. Uh, then they can they can just sort of download their own software kind of like do whatever they want. Um, that hasn't happened, um, but it realizing that did make it clear that sort of the Rift store, the Oculus store, became in that case a better option. They can do the same thing in the Oculus store, um, but again, it, it hasn't been much of a problem. Um, we do make sure that we go through and um, curate on a regular, well, we go through and we kind of weed the software titles on a regular basis because they can download free things and install them. Um, again, Oculus is pretty focused on education, uh, so they, I haven't seen a lot of that. But we kind of check every day to make sure there's nothing on there that we don't want on there. It's easy to uninstall anything that is on there. And that's the same with Steam. Um, so we found that these two uh, pretty much equivalent. Um, the biggest difference between the Oculus Store and the Steam Store is that a lot of titles on the Steam Store are not designed to work with our hardware. Um, mm. So that's another reason why we've stayed focused on, um, on the Oculus Store. But again, if you make a different technology choice, so for instance, if one of the viewers here decides to buy, uh, for instance, the HTC Vive, the one that works with Steam, this would be a different set of decisions, right? There you go, the fancy Vive Cosmos was just on the screen for a minute. If that's the technology that you buy, then the Steam store is gonna be better because everything on there is gonna work with the Vive. Um, so it kind of, you have to make a paired decision. You have to decide, so the choice of hardware will determine what your best choice of software catalog is. And if you decide to make that decision based on the software catalog, it'll determine what your best hardware is. And obviously, uh, also, additionally, that's the word, um, Oculus and Steam, or Oculus and, and Vive are not the only two options. There is the, the PlayStation um, VR option, and there are others beyond that even. Um, so, next thing I want to talk about is balancing education and fun. Um, we have a, we have, because there are a lot of free programs, a lot of free education ones, a lot of free kind of teaser uh, entertainment programs as well. Uh, this is why we're constantly monitoring you know, our, our catalog here. Um, we, we knew from the beginning with the Oculus that we wanted our focus to be on alignment between what the library is offering in terms of virtual reality and what is being taught at Shadron State College. Um, that meant that we had to create partnerships with faculty. Um, that would be our best way to do that. Obviously, we can go through the catalog ourselves and see what's being taught, but you know, it's much more effective, we think, if the faculty are driving the software purchases. Our initial investments in this, uh, are the first program that we highlighted was actually requested by a faculty member so that you could use it in a class, and we wanted to continue on that pathway. Um, I was wondering, do some of the faculty already know that some things might exist for their particular? Uh, yeah. 
I think with the um, so the first um, the first real faculty interest we got was from um, new faculty orientation, which all new professors um, at Chattern State go through, and this was a few months before Nate started with us. Um, but we showed them around the library. We showed them our media lab. The VR was still in the media lab at that point. And this professor was just a real gung-ho person. And she teaches anatomy. And anatomy is great, you know, if you can get that in a 3D yeah. um, environment. And so she actually went back and researched a lot on her own. She was like, oh, you have VR. Let me see what, what is available. And so um, share care, I believe, is something that she found, and she found a few other ones. Um, and then we were able to install those and all of that. And then when Nate came on board, um, he installed it. We got everything. Yeah. We got everything moving. Yeah. So um, she was a little bit of an outlier in that yeah. she did all of the research for us. Yeah. Uh, but it was great because when Nate started, we could just say, "Okay, here's the first thing we'd like you to do right. is to get going on some of this anatomy stuff." Yeah. Um, really cool program actually creates a virtual human body has a lot of animation show you like how does the pancreas work what does it look like when the stomach receives food you know it's called share care uh, yeah it's called share care VR um, you might be able to get a demo uh, there, it is. there you go that's it uh, oh. if you click that play um, if you move up to the image there at the top of the banner there oh. you go uh, that'll give you a little um, sketch, and this is some, this is the kind of stuff you'll see when you're inside of it. You have a lot of really granular control. Uh, that's showing the nerve impulses. This is one of the models that they have. I mean, you know, if you're squeamish, it could be terrifying, but it's very, <laughs> I think it's very cool. That's probably a good way if you're an anatomy yeah. student. If you're squeamish by this, yeah, yeah, probably not so much anatomy. Yes, <laughs> um, but you know, you can see. I mean, it, it offers like a really interesting option. Um, aside from sort of physical models, which are very expensive, and textbooks, which are two-dimensional. Um, mm -hmm. There is some preliminary research out there. I can provide uh, the, some papers if anybody's interested that suggest that virtual reality um, anatomy can, can be helpful and actually provide measurable educational outcomes. Yeah. So. And we do have a cadaver lab. Yes, we, um, do. we do. But this is just a nice supplement to that. Yeah. Uh, and it works. We've managed to get train the learning lab tutors on it, um, so they can bring students. If a student's coming in looking for anatomy homework, this is an option that the tutors have as well. Uh, another tool for them. Um, so we've attempted sort of because we we feel like we we got a really good outcome with uh, with that initial um, interaction between this this faculty member and the library uh, in terms of her recommending a piece of software that we now think is very useful. Uh, we've tried to kind of replicate that by sticking close to faculty. Um, there's been some challenges there. Anybody else that's at an educational institution knows faculty are very busy. They're very focused on their own work and their own scholarship. Um, I'll tell you about some of the things that didn't work so well, cold emailing the department saying, hey, we've got this great thing. What, what, you guys interested? Here's a couple of examples. No, no response. <laughs> uh, maybe other, maybe people would uh, write better than I do. Maybe they would have better luck. But um, we did, though, have much better luck going through the teaching and learning technology uh, office here. Um, we used, we set up a workshop and advertised the workshop with faculty, including faculty that were already using virtual reality, already interested in it, uh, faculty that had read a little bit about it, um, but hadn't used it yet, and some that just sort of were curious because they saw the posters around campus. Um, that workshop produced a lot of really interesting discussion um, and actually got several people using it that had never you know, even heard of it before. So now I think at least two professors from that initial maybe eight, 10 that showed up at the workshop have started to sort of use it in some capacity, maybe even more than two or three. Anyway, um, they're running it in, as extra credit programs and as uh, smaller portions of assignments. Um, so um, this allowed us to make sure that there's alignment with the curriculum. So now we have professors that are aware of virtual reality that will ask us to find things for them and that will, will work with us to set up these projects where their students come to the library and use the virtual reality technology. Um, let's see. So another thing that we do, we've decided to do since that, that has also worked really well, is that any even marginal interest from a faculty member that emails us about virtual reality, we treat as serious interest. 
meaning that if we get a one-line email from someone in the business department that's like, hey, I heard about this thing on like the TV the other night, you know anything about that? Uh, we go and we find three related programs, we send an email with links to those programs and an explanation of how it works, how it might work for them. And um, I would say that you do that even with right. more marginal interest. So that's someone true. like, oh, you have VR, yes. then they will still do that because that's, that's like true. somebody, yeah. it's at least an opening. Yeah, mm -hmm. because it's so new and because there is serious like investment of time for a faculty member to integrate something into their any teacher, and even you know, any teacher has to, they have a set of strategies that work for them to change that is a significant investment. Uh, we want to do as much of that work for them so that you know it makes it easy for them to, to integrate this new technology. Mm -hmm. uh, so look, we'll look up a list of potentially relevant programs, provide them with links to something like this that gives them a sense of or uh, what we're seeing on the screen share, uh, something that gives them a sense of what they could do. Uh, and at the same time, offer a sort of appointment for a, a personalized introduction to this space, this virtual reality area. Um, so they, they can come in and not have to, and someone is here to show them how the headset works, you know, mm -hmm. show them how to get the hand controllers, start the program for them, take all that cognitive load off of their shoulders so they can just think, how do I want to apply this to what I'm teaching? Uh, and then they'll they'll figure it out as they use it and go forward. We, we've had good luck with that, uh, much better than we told them. Um, <laughs> uh, so. And then we've also tried to take it to yeah. people um, a few times. So uh, this spring we had a, or was it this spring? Yep. Um, we had a campus showcase where various, yeah, this fall, yeah. various departments could go show what they're doing. And so um, this was before we had mounted everything. So we took the sensors and we took things with us just to kind of, so then people could try it on for a few seconds and see what it's like. Yeah. Um, there was like a band and a table with food. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. So, um, so since they're mounted, we probably wouldn't do that with the big setup yeah. um, again, but we think that we might do it with the Go. You can get a pretty good good experience with that. And also, um, the great thing about the Go is it's pretty user-friendly and yeah. it's pretty um, idiot-proof, yeah, um, for lack of a better word. It's but intuitive. It's, just, yeah, it's very intuitive and it's, there's a low barrier of entry. Yeah. Um, you just put it on. I'm not a huge video game person, so to me, some of the A and B and the trigger mm -hmm. is a little bit more um, difficult. But with this, you just kind of look at things, and it's just it's just nice. You get the yeah. whole experience. If you can work a laser pointer, you can work. <laughs> you can work the go. Yep. I like some of the things that's in here on the go page. They do have like an education section, but also I noticed here the travel. Yes. Yeah. Very These cool. places using VR that you would maybe be able to actually travel to in person. Yeah, we've actually used this Zion Narrows one a couple of times. Um, it's, it's, you know, photorealistic. It's really interesting. I mean, you know, uh, they're, they're one of the things they talked about in the Educause seminar was, you know, in a time of limited budgets, um, this provides something like an alternative to actual, I mean, we wouldn't want to replace field trips with this, but if you can't bring your kids and, and to the Zion Narrows and you want your geology class to get a sense of what this looks like, you know, how narrow and, you know, mm -hmm. deep and high everything is and what the strata look like, um, this provides an alternative, uh, alternative to something that's really out of budget. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, it, and as we said before, it's much more impressive when you actually have the headset on. It's really hard to to talk about the difference between a 2D representation and an actual 3D experience. I, I, I think it's, a, it's kind of a new frontier. Well, it's not that new, I guess, uh, but it's novel. Uh, so uh, the last part of this that I'll say is uh, we, we've, we've made attempt to gather user feedback. Uh, what didn't work? Posted signs with links to surveys or please email us if you have an idea. Uh, very little response to that. Um, we have comment cards that we printed out and I'll show you guys these. Uh, it just kind of looks like this. Mm -hmm. oh. Good, yep. Um, uh, we've got a lot a lot more feedback through these, just kind of leaving them in there uh, than with any other option. So if you're looking to gather feedback and you've set something up like this, comment cards is what I endorse. <laughs> uh, let's see. But so um, I'm gonna turn it over now. We've talked about our setup a lot. I'm gonna turn it over to Carl. And Carl will tell you a little bit more about what's going on at the public library down the road. Sure. Cool. So I just want to um, touch on briefly on some advantages and disadvantages of going with the PlayStation 4. 
um, it's relatively low cost to the PC setup. You don't have to build a custom gaming computer. The only thing you need to do is go to the store, buy a PS4, buy the headset, you're, you're good to go. Um, it can reach a broader audience since you don't have to build a computer and you don't have to go buy a really expensive computer. Um, you just buy a PS4, it's, it's relatively cheap, I think it's around $400. Um, the headset itself is 200 so the experience is similar to the Oculus Rift, but at a lower cost. Um, there is exclusive titles that are only for the PS4 that you can't find on Steam or the Oculus Store or anything like that. Um, and like I said, it's pretty easy to use. You don't have to be a wizard at, at any of this stuff. <laughs> Um, some of the disadvantages, the resolution is lower. The PS4 isn't as powerful as what you could build. Um, so the visual fidelity is not as great, but I've noticed that the quality is similar. Um, the library of games is smaller compared to Steam or Oculus. You're stuck with the PlayStation 4 store. Um, you can't go to other stores. Um, the tracking system is pretty limited too. Um, it uses a camera, so it can't see you. If you turn around, it'll say you're out of your play zone. And that mm -hmm. gets kind of frustrating. With the Oculus, you have three sensors, so if you turn all the way around, it's still gonna be able to track you. And with PS4, it can't do that. Um, and the library for the PS4 is mostly geared towards games. It's there's not many educational titles compared to mm -hmm. the Oculus. So yeah, but that I mean, we we really invest in educational titles because we wanted that. Uh, that was our strategy was to align with the uh, the curriculum. Um, but I think in a in a public library context, you know, uh, not at a teaching institution where that's. I mean our. Our budget is measured in alignment to some True. extent. So. And I think our goals were different. I think the public library, one of the things was to showcase some new technology, mm -hmm. also to bring um, some new students and new new people into the library. And yeah. you were able to accomplish that with, yeah. with yeah. the VR. We brought a, word of mouth is very powerful, especially with the kids. Mm -hmm. They'll go back to school and say, oh, the library has really cool VR. Yeah. And then we'll get more and more kids. And so it increases our patron count quite yeah. a bit. Yeah. So, um, I guess the last thing we wanted to say um, before we open it up for any questions you might have is um, a, a warning. <laughs> a warning. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think with all this stuff, since it is new and emerging, it can be easy to kind of get swept up in fads. And I don't know if you noticed, but we have a stationary bike in the back <laughs> corner. Um, okay. And it's in the corner because it doesn't get pretty <laughs> much any use. Um, we got this maybe, it was before Nate's time, um, and I think there's only one game that it yeah. works with, <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's cool. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's used it. It was <laughs> fairly expensive, and um, I think maybe we, we thought that maybe there would be some, some games that would measure like physiological responses or other things that we could do with the hyper department or with um, anatomy, biology, things like that. And that really did not materialize. Right. So um, so yes, we have definitely made some missteps along yeah. the way. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the lesson of this bike is that uh, just to sort of carefully measure, you know, what existing interest is and make sure you explore the software catalog before you make a large purchase. <laughs> so I mean, you know, because this is this is new, this is new technology. The the hardware and software are developing really quickly, uh, and it's but it's very sales driven. So mm -hmm. um, the you know we don't have an option that's comparable to Oculus or Steam that's exclusively focused on education. So mm -hmm. you know the Oculus Store. This is the, and this is a weakness. The Oculus Store and the Steam Store. They're they're always going to be trying to sell you the next thing. Uh, you can see this in the way that Oculus is, instead of just adding the Rift S, they have they have stopped offering the Rift. So now the newer thing is the only thing you can buy. So this mm -hmm. can be a challenge. I mean, if you're if you're a nonprofit institution, you're looking to be careful about your budget. You're looking to keep things focused on utility and education. 
Uh, of course, fun can be a part of that too, uh, but you just want to make sure that the, the power of the new cool thing sales drive does not uh, lead you down the wrong path too often to spend money that doesn't get used very much. So you need a critical eye. What you need to take a critical eye and look at what you need and what you want uh, before you jump, uh, you know, with with your budget. So yeah. right. start slow. Don't jump in with everything. You know. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Yeah, and and I think you know a good way to see like if if this had been requested, we would have definitely purchased it if we had patrons and students saying we now now we would ask you know who wants this first is mm -hmm. there a class that this works in um, yeah. so we would explore with hyper and say like hey this is a thing we could buy here are some examples of programs we could use it on here's mm -hmm. maybe a way you could use it in your class is anybody interested uh, and if they say yes then then we would purchase it but if they don't uh you know then then no it's not worth yeah. it probably we have a little buyer's remorse about a little just, time. just the time. Uh, that seems like something that actually what i think about that is that someone who is trying to get in shape they would use that and use vr to pretend i'm actually going up and down the mountains yeah. rather yeah. than just sitting in my ba in my family room doing this watching tv or something yeah, yeah. it's true as long as you're not one of the many people to get motion sickness you know? <laughs> right yeah um, you are on a roller coaster on a bike, lots of, I mean, you'd have to be careful <laughs> to make sure that, that it works for you, but um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think that's that's all the all the content we've prepared. Mm -hmm. um, you guys, so we, we would love to turn it over for questions if anybody yeah, 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 absolutely. Does anybody have any questions? Type them into your question section of your GoToWebinar interface. It looks like uh, people have stuck around with us, even though we've gone a little over time. Um, we'll do whatever we need to to get, we'll stay as long as we need to to get through any questions or anything else that um, Nate and Christina and Carl want to share. Um, I did um, myself once uh, test out the, I think it was a Rift, um, last year, the year before, at an event that I was at, at a, at a meeting, and it was very interesting. It was, um, luckily, I guess I don't get motion sickness. I didn't have any issues with that uh, when I was in, in the headset. But it was interesting, because you talked about having the space, and that made me think of that experience, and my experience, that I was very concerned about, well, if I walk over to that thing I see, am I gonna walk bump into somebody or something. Right. So I was kind, you, you kind of are thinking about looking at what you're seeing and what else is in this room around me. And there's a weird kind of dichotomy there of I don't want to, I want to go see that, but I don't want to bump into something. Well, yeah, I was going to say with the, with the Oculus, it has a virtual boundary. So mm -hmm. you know exactly how far you're able to go. Right. Um, the thing I don't like about the PS4 is it doesn't have that. So you kind of need somebody else there to say, hey, you're going a little bit too far. You're going to bump into something. Yeah. That's yeah. something I really wish the PlayStation 4 VR had. Yeah, because I think that we had it. They didn't have any of those. They didn't have extra things like sensors set up. It was just a here, have a quickie experience, put the headset on. And But there's people, you know, there's most people there running the thing and all. So, yeah. Yeah, the virtual boundary is one of the main reasons why we moved up here. I think I mentioned this earlier, but... It, it has a minimum space requirement. It can't be smaller than a certain amount. Um, now we can use it because we have this bigger room. What it does is as you're moving around in whatever program you're using, once you get to that virtual boundary, uh, it just like shows up like a big neon green fence, basically. Um, so if you, it's, it's visual only, but it's a, visual, it's a strong visual cue that you're reaching the edge of the safe playable area. Um, right. And you can determine what the dimensions and exact shape of that boundary are when you set up the sensors. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it, it's pretty customizable within certain guide. It can't be larger than a certain amount. It can't be smaller than a certain amount, but you have a lot of flexibility in there. So we have, for instance, seating in this, in this VR space. And when we set up the virtual boundary, made sure that it doesn't cross into the areas where there are chairs. You know, so if you're moving close to where a spectator might be sitting, you're going to know that as a user. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and, and I think it's, it's pretty good. I mean, we still encourage people for the first time to have someone here with them. Sure. Um, okay. be, beyond the sort of how do we negotiate real space and virtual space, um, there is also, there's just the immersion is so strong. A lot of people will, when they pull the headset off, for instance, one of the most common experiences is, oh, I thought I was facing a different direction. <laughs> you know, yeah. I thought I was facing that way, but I'm facing over here. I didn't you realize know. I had turned in real life. <laughs> right. And and another reason to have a buddy is is because of the uh, the cord. You know, sure. you can 
see if you have over relief. Yeah. Um, they're not wireless so, devices. Right, and you can buy them. They they exist now, but they're 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 expensive add-ons. Uh, I think the industry is going in that direction, though. And at some point, that sure. will be the standard, probably you know two or three years. Um, but it, it's pretty easy to manage. You know, you're not moving around in a huge space, and it's you can feel where the cord is on you. So as long as you're cognizant of that as a user, it, it's not too bad. And it's pretty long, so it, yeah. it, you have to work some to get tripped on it. But it is possible. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I do have a question for Carl um, at the public yeah. library. Um, sure. Have you done any? Um, what kind of programs or programming have you done related to it using the the PlayStation VR at the library? I mean, obviously you have it available, but have you done any specific programs or events related to it? So we have our regular VR night, and we oh. have it on um, the first and third Tuesday of each mm -hmm. month. Um, the only program that we've done, I would say, is our tech petting zoo, where we had all of our new tech on display where people can try it out. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I'm thinking about doing is they have a Apollo 11 VR um, kind of experience. Oh. And the 50th anniversary is coming up fairly soon. So I was trying to figure out a way to integrate that into, into that experience. And also the children's reading program right the summer reading program this year is a universe of stories because of the apollo of an anniversary yeah yeah so i'm working with the children's librarian to integrate that into Ooh, the program as well. so there's an apollo 11 is there something that's part of playstation or is it some other software it's on the playstation store i believe it's on the steam store as well i think it's on the oculus store as well yeah Mm-hmm. You have a search over here. Uh, uh, hey, look. Okay. Hello, 11 VR. Yeah. Yeah, often if you have... Uh, Turn off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good. I mean, that's, that's the big danger of the Steam store is every once in a while they're like, deep discount <laughs> you end up yeah, buying yeah. spending more than you would anyway you know. don't even um, want to know what their next big sale is no <laughs> often you'll see if there's a nonprofit or educational institution backing um an event like this you'll see that's when you see a program that exists on almost all the platforms mm -hmm. because then you have you have a larger organization funding a, a spread that kind of covers as much ground as possible sure um, because they do, I mean, the, the software has to be written differently for, for different each, uh, each program. Yeah. And as you can see, this one, the developer and publisher is something called Immersive VR Education Limited. Yeah. Right. So. Awesome. All right. Um, well, it doesn't look like there's any other questions that came in. Um, so I think maybe we will um, wrap it up to our, you know, for the for this show. Um, if any of you guys do have questions, you do know where to, you guys can all Google a uh, Shadron State College and Shadron Public Library and find um, everybody to ask them more questions. Uh, do you guys have any last words, anything else you want to share before we do uh, wrap up for this morning? Just that there's a really cool PowerPoint, a set of very informational <laughs> PowerPoint slides that didn't make it uh, that I will make sure you have that uh, any, it's especially interesting for anyone looking at actually getting into this technology, bringing it to their, uh, to their institution. Uh, yeah. should be I made it with utility in mind so hopefully someone will get some use out of it yeah yeah um we'll have that available when the archive goes up I'll put it in there so you guys just email that to me when you're done with this and we'll get it up there this afternoon okay thank you very much Thanks. thank you yeah thank you thank you everyone for attending thank you uh Nathan and uh Christine and Carl this is this is great to learn about I really want to try more of the virtual reality I did like it when I tried it out it's fun um, it's yeah. really interesting it's, yeah awesome. Happen to be around Shadron, Nebraska. You're welcome yep. to come out and experience it in person. Absolutely. Yeah. Go, go, go. <laughs> yeah. go up to go visit the library, see all the the yeah. That the, the hard to get out that way a lot, um, but I have been out there quite a few times myself. Yes. Right. Well, next time. All right. <laughs>
So, so that will wrap it up for today's show. Um, as I said, we do record the show and it is being recorded and it will be here on our um, website, our Encompass Live website. Um, if you do Google Encompass Live or use your search engine of choice, so far we're the only thing called that out there. So hopefully nothing else will ever call themselves that. Um, we have our upcoming shows here, but our archives are right underneath the list of upcoming shows. There's a link to our archives. Most recent one is it'll be on the top of the list. Today's should be available by the end of the day today. Um, we post our recordings to the Nebraska Library Commission's YouTube channel. So the um, video will be there. And then the slides that um, Nate will send to me will be included as well. So you have access to both of those. Uh, we will, um, everyone who attended live this morning and registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know when it's ready. Um, and I'll also let you know here while we're on the archive page, we do have a search feature here. You can search our entire archives or just the most recent 12 months, the most recent year. Um, this is because Encompass Live has, this is our, it was originally started in January 2009, um, a little over 10 years ago. So we do have our full entire archive here of every show we've ever done. Uh, we are librarians, so we save things in archive for historical purposes. <laughs> so uh, when you are searching our archives, as I said, you can look for recent things. You don't really have to date information, but if you just want to know anything we've done, pay attention when you do watch an archive. They're all dated, so you can find out when that show was originally broadcast. Some of our older shows may um, be, um, the information might not be good anymore, the website might not exist anymore, links might be broken, the service or program we're talking about may have a, um, stopped or you know morphed into something else um, but just pay attention to the date when you're there in our archives so that will be for our archive uh, um, i hope you join us next week when our topic is providing passports at your library uh, this is something we started doing here at the nebraska library commission it's something that libraries can do um, you can work with um, the um, passport agency in the United States and they will get you set up for this. We're going to show how the commission has done it, how we got started. We've been doing it for less, little less than a year. Um, and you can actually make a little money off of it, a little income. So that will be for next week's show. Please do sign up for that. Any of our other ones. Um, Encompass Live is also on Facebook. You can see our Facebook links here. This is our Facebook page. We've put notifications up here of when new shows are coming up. Here's a reminder to log in for today's show. When our recordings are available and ready, we post on here. So if you are a big Facebook user, give us a like over there and you'll get notified about when things are happening. So other than that, that wraps up for today's show. Thank you everyone for being here and hopefully we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.